you know, because <laughs> I really like algae. And so I'm always hoping that I'm going to convince other people that they're really worth studying. So um, I will I probably have far too many slides. I'm really happy to take questions as we go, or if you want to um, save up questions or send them through the chat, whichever seems the easiest way for you. OK, so um, I was told to talk about seaweeds of Aotearoa this evening, a quick review of what they are, a bit about their ecology and economic importance, and a bit about what's going on with research in New Zealand and the future of seaweed research. And so I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to touch on most of those topics. Um, I like to remind people about where we are, because I think it's really, New Zealand is a, a great place to study marine science. We are in such an interesting position on the globe, and we really are surrounded by water. Our extended economic zone and, um, and continental shelf region make us one of the largest maritime countries in the world. And so, yeah, a great place to be for all sorts of reasons. Our isolation, um, we're one of the last places on the planet where for human settlement and so on. So yeah, really interesting place to be. And I think that this is also makes us particularly interesting because this area up here, so the dotted line is the extended continental shelf, the ECS, and the solid line is the ex, um, exclusive economic zone. And this part um, circles the Kumadek Trench and the Kumadek Islands or Rangitahu are along here. But we also go right down to Auckland and Campbell Island and we have these wonderful plateaus underwater, extraordinary underwater river systems, the Chatham Islands, you know, we're an archipelago, but we're also part of um, we've an ancient continent, which is um, below sea level. And so really interesting uh, and diverse features in the, in the area. The other thing which really um, we really stand out in, in terms of the oceanic swells and storms that we experience, we're a really high wave energy environment. And so when people start to talk about seaweed farming and, uh, and offshore seaweed farming, the New Zealand context is quite different from some other parts on the planet. So it's really worth remembering this. We are a place of high wave energy and we are surrounded because we're such a long distance from um, other land masses. And so broadly, the seaweeds or macroalgae can be grouped into the greens and browns and reds. And they're very diverse morphologically and, and diverse phylogenetically as well. So they're just... No, no, they're and so, you know, yeah. that makes things really um, interesting, I think, for sources, things that are worth and interesting to study. The brown seaweeds are probably the ones that people are most familiar with, with Hormosara and Davilia. Most New Zealanders would be very familiar with these as part of their growing up and going to the shore. But there's also other kinds of brown algae, fine filamentous ones, these fantastic um, fat, swollen splachnidium, which have this wonderful clear gel in them, which has all sorts of interesting properties. So they have all kinds of uh, diversity that a lot of which is still to be explored. So there's, these are the iridescent blades of a, of a champia. These red algae are really important for carrageenans. This is asparagopsis, the red seaweed that people are very interested in for its methane antimethanogenic properties. And here's a whole bunch of really incredibly curious and interesting red seaweeds. These are all red, even though they're different colors um, up in Manawatafi, up in the Three Kings. So um, we're on this pretty steep trajectory still of discovery, which is very cool, but it can be very daunting. <laughs> we're up to over a thousand species. Many of them are still undescribed or poorly known. So if you have an interest in things taxonomic or phylogenetic and understanding relationships, hey, there's lots and lots of really interesting questions to tackle amongst the algae. And the, it's an issue because um, can we actually um, can we actually understand our flora properly? Can we recognize the effects of environmental change if we don't actually know what species are present? So how do we understand structure and functioning of coastal ecosystems if we don't actually know the component parts? It's a big issue. And so that recognition of change, you know, you need baseline data, you need some basic information. And we're really at a pretty rudimentary stage still in, species discovery, understanding distributions and attributes. And so um, 
you know, when we did a survey a few years ago, we found that 44% of the species in New Zealand are known from five or fewer records. And 17% of our flora is only known from being discovered once. So what can you say about its timing of reproduction or seasonality or its distribution, you know, from one place at one time? So lots to do in terms of real basic getting out there and looking and becoming familiar with what's around. Um, and so in um, 2019, um, the, the Niwa seaweed team, that's me and Kate and Roberta, along with Jeremy Rolfe from DOC, went through and analyzed the, um, the macroalgae of New Zealand, applying the New Zealand threat classification system to it. And at that time we assessed um, 938 species, we didn't assess a whole lot of corallines that were being in the process of being documented at that time. And yeah, 65% are data deficient. That is, we don't really have enough information to say what's going on with the population. So like I say, lots to do. But, you know, if you're on land um, and you're an ecologist, you think often about um, about forest structure or vegetation structure. And so that's one way of thinking about the um, upper subtitle or the euphotic zone underwater. We have all these wonderful forests. We have Lasonia forests and Aclonia forests, and we have mixed assemblages. This is on the Chatham Islands with the lo local um, Lasonia and Fucales underneath, these large brown algae, these mixed fucoids. And so New Zealand has a really interesting diversity of these large brown algae in, in shallow and, and um, upper subtitles, I say, you know, 30 to 50 meters depth, some really interesting seaweeds. And we also have macrocystis forests. Um, they, macrocystis starts in its distribution from about Cook Strait South. So you folks up in Auckland wouldn't be seeing it, but it's certainly a big part of the underwater landscape, um, seascape from in the South. And then we have all these fantastic um, under, under forest, under the canopy, all kinds of species that um, provide an enormously rich diversity of habitat and, uh, and species interactions. And, and a personal focus of mine at the moment is around the corallines and the coralline assemblages are really the dominant reef cover when you go right through and look underneath all the kelp forests, look underneath what's on the rock surfaces and corallines provide a very important part of that whole ecosystem. And we still know little about our corallines in New Zealand. Another whole area of work which um, it's important and, and for which we know little still, uh, uh, life histories. So some of the life histories of seaweeds are really clear cut and we know quite a bit about them, but for many species we don't have that information. So the classic kelp life history is a two-stage one where the stage that you look at that you see on the shore or underwater is the sporophyte, it produces spores, but it alternates with a microscopic fuzz stage, this sort of microscopic brown filaments. So the source is where the spores are produced, they're zoospores, spores, male and female, and they release and produce sperm and eggs, and then you get back to the um, this stage. But this, this um, microscopic gametophyte stage can actually stay almost as a resting stage. It can hang about underwater, very inconspicuous, and then when the conditions are right, whether it's temperature or light, it will be triggered into the sexual phase of its life history. Um, and so that's a reasonably direct kind of well-known, well-documented. And similarly for bull kelp and all the fucoids, you've got a really straightforward life history. You get eggs and sperm and zygotes and it's very straightforward. So you have, you might have separate males and females or they might be on the same plant. Um, and you have a very straightforward, you know, life history. But the there's all sorts of interesting consequences about the timing of fertility. And unless we understand that, there can be all sorts of issues about a huge storm comes through, removes all the seaweed, and the habitat space may go into a state of flux because the things that can recruit back are going to be the ones that are fertile at that time of year. And so you can have all sorts of interesting interactions of recovery from um, catastrophic events, whether it's a human induced change or whether it's a natural event, you know. Um, and so that's a really interesting thing to understand the dynamics of your local ecosystem in terms of the fertility and timing and so on, the seasonality. 
And so here's a sort of some snapshots of some of the few Kaleys in New Zealand. We've got about 30 some species um, in a bunch of different genera. And um, some of them are truly um, beautiful, all intriguing. This is Marginariella, not something you'd see up in the Auckland area so much, but certainly in the south. And it has the most wonderful apex. Um, it's just a, a most beautiful thing as it unfurls and um, really interesting species. And here's some work that um, we were doing a bit of a study here um, in a project that Roberta was leading, looking at using brown algae to as indicators of ecosystem health around New Zealand. And we realized that there was a whole lot of information that was missing about basic reproduction of things like some of the carpophyllum species and marginariella. So this is a picture here of marginariella and the little golden balls are the eggs that are being released. And these streams of white are streams of sperm that are being released from the reproductive conceptacles. Um, and then um, it's pretty straightforward. The eggs are very heavy. And so the mating would have to happen. The, the sperm is motile, but you do need them to be in fairly close proximity because they're not going to travel very far from the parent plants. And sometimes the life histories are really confusing. So something like Dactylosiphon bullosus looks like this, but it also looks like this. So it can be a crust and it can be these saccate, um, you know, sort of tubular structures. And so it's not always obvious what things are alternating with one another. And so if you saw this brown crust on the rocks when you're doing your uh, diving or intertidally, you can't actually tell which species it's connected with, because there are brown crusts that alternate with a number of different species. And there are also some brown crusts that are just brown crusts. They just belong to themselves. They don't link up with any other species or, or any other genera. So understanding these things and becoming familiar with what's happening in your local patch is um, really important. And there's been very little work done on um, crusts in New Zealand up till now, both brown crusts and red crusts. And so we've got a lot of discovery still about What's, what belongs to what when they look so very, very different. Um, and then the really challenging and super interesting ones are the, this group of um, species that belong to the, in the Bangiales. So it's a very, what we consider to be a very old lineage of the red algae. And it's the, um, the source of the seaweeds that are used for sushi for, uh, uh, you know, the wrapping, the nori sheets that are used on the outside of your sushi. And it's a group that's highly prized um, internationally. But when I started work on it, everything was called porphyra. And then we expanded that and became porphyra, pyropia and plymene, and the sathea and a few others. And now even more genera are being described because we realize they're actually very, very different from one another. Um, in New Zealand, all of our species are just one cell layer thick, but they have incredibly complicated life histories. So in Māori, no um, porphyra and pyropia is um, karingo um, on the east coast. Um, I think it's Ngāti Pūrō calls it pārengo as well. In Britain, it's called lava or lava. In Nori, Sakai, there's lots of names for this stuff. And, um, but, and it's really prized because it's very high in protein and minerals. And so it's been used traditionally all over the world. But what you find with um, this group of, of genera is they have the most complex life histories of any organisms that have ever been described. So they have a blade phase and the pale areas are male, like here. And the dark pink areas or the darker pink areas are like here, which is fertilized females, but not always fertilized females. And they can produce spores which just repeat the blade, or they can produce spores that turn into this microscopic phase, which then in turn produces spores, which may produce more blades, but may not. And so there's all these different kinds of conscious spores and neutral, spore, neutral spores and archaeospores. And it is amazingly complex, but it's a really interesting thing because this is a group of um, algae that has um, the longest uh, fossil record of any group of algae. It, it extends way back beyond the KT boundary. These are algae that can survive over huge periods of time and huge stresses. And so they are very well equipped with a range of 
um, reproductive uh, mechanisms to enable survival under a, a very wide range of stresses and conditions. Um, and there's a lot more really cool stuff that could be done on these. And the really interesting thing was that in Japan and in China and other parts of the world, um, as I said, they're very highly prized. This is a, uh, an 18th century woodcut and it's a picture of women in Tokyo Bay and they're collecting what was called porphyra. And in the background, you can see that there's sticks in the sea. And what they've done is they've put like these um, bamboo sticks into the water at a particular time of year. And what happens is that blades would settle on these sticks. And then they would make the nori sheets that we're very familiar with, that we use to wrap our sushi, on this sort of paper making process. So they would chop up the seaweed very finely and they would make these sheets. Well, essentially, um, this process carried on for hundreds of years. But it was really interesting that in the 1940s, this woman here, Kathleen Drew, a British scientist working uh, on seaweeds and particularly looking at some um, seaweeds that uh, she found algae growing in shells and it was called Conchocelis rosea. And she connected up these filaments of red algae that were growing between the layers of shells and connected it up with porphyra and understood for the first time the life history of porphyra. So this is a statue to Kathleen Drew that is in a shrine that overlooks the Ariaki Sea in Japan because it totally transformed the ability of, of um, fishing communities in Japan to actually start farming this in a very, instead of just putting their bamboo stakes into the sea at a particular time of year and hoping for the best, they could actually start controlling the life history. So this is a, this is a seed bank, if you like, in Japan. So this is, this is only part of the building that I was in. Um, and each of these are strings, there's big tanks of water and a whole series of strings of shell. And the dark stain inside these shells is the conchocelis stage of the porphyra. And um, those shells are kept under particular temp temperature and light conditions so that they don't go fertile. And then they're triggered to be fertile at a particular time when they're ready to seed the nets. So these big frames are used for seeding the nets. And here's some nets that have been wound onto these big frames. These are tanks of water. And on the bottom of the tanks, there are the shells. And they're controlling the light and temperature so that the conchocelis in the shells will start sporulating and the spores will be released and land up on the nets. Um, this is the most valuable aquaculture industry in Japan. And it's also very important in Korea and, and in China as well. And this is, I was at a, visiting a fisherman's uh, collective in southern Tokyo Bay, and here's a whole lot of nets that have had the baby porphyrus settled, pyropias settled on them. And the really cool thing is that you can actually put the nets into a freezer and keep them at minus five degrees and, and a bit lower as well. And you can put them out into the sea when the conditions are right, and you can store up some nets just in case there's some kind of catastrophic storm or disease event or whatever, and you can put out the nets again and replenish your farm when you need to. And so when you're looking down on the water on a, on a nori farm, that's what it looks like with all the young tender blades growing. And um, yeah, the, the farms extend really extensively. They cover um, almost 2000 square kilometers of sea surface in Japan. And these are the kinds of boats that they use for harvesting. So they're quite low in the water. They have these containers for catching the seaweed. And this is essentially like a lawnmower. And so what happens is that they go out into the water and they go underneath the nets. And the nets pass over the mowing device and the seaweed drops into the containers. And, and then it's brought back to port and it's put in these big tanks where the seaweed is um, stirred by these um, arms and with the fresh seawater. And then that's pumped up to the factory where it gets turned into sheets of um, nori for your enjoyment as sushi wrapper. And here's the guy that's come down from um, Tokyo to um, judge the quality. And it, 
critically important because he's looking for any imperfections in the sheets, any um, anything that any gaps, any holes. You're looking for consistency of color and consistency of, of material and stuff, and um, super important. So that. that Understanding life history has, was critical to the success of that particular industry. And more recently, what's been critical to the success of that industry has been understanding more about the systematics and the species that are involved. And um, that's been quite revolutionary. A whole lot of really cool stuff been happening in probably the last decade or so with increasing use of molecular tools. So seaweeds get used in all kinds of things. Um, as sea vegetables for us and functional foods, um, all sorts of livestock feeds and animal health products um, for methane reduction, a lot of aquaculture feeds, um, as fertilizer, soil conditioner, biofuels, and on it goes. A lot of extracted compounds too. And so you probably are consuming seaweeds in all sorts of ways that you're even unaware of on a daily basis. Globally, there's a about 11,000 bit more species um, of seaweeds, but actually there's really few that are domesticated. And so the main ones that are domesticated are um, Eucuma and Capophycus, very common um, carotenophytes in the tropics, Gracilaria and agar seaweed, Pyropia, that's the basis for the Nordic industry, Saccharin is a kelp in the Northern Hemisphere, and then also Anderia, another kelp. And most of the production is actually through aquaculture. There is still some wild harvest, but the, it's really growing. Um, this there was probably 15 million tons about 10 years ago. So the aquaculture side of, of seaweed um, industry is really growing a lot. Um, and so, yeah, you encounter seaweeds in your daily life all the time. So in your shampoos and toothpaste and goodness knows what else and paints. And really the main functions of the ex extracts are to enable gels to be formed or emulsifiers. So, you know, your, your McDonald's chocolate milk the chocolate doesn't all fall to the bottom of the container. It's all those, it's the particles are suspended throughout. And similarly with salad dressings and things like that, you've got an, a, an emulsion rather than separating out into layers. And there's all kinds of food additives. And so if you actually are interested in what you're um, consuming, it, it's worth knowing which numbers. Are. So these are the numbers that you may see on a frozen dessert or something that you see in the supermarket. Those are the numbers that tell you that you're looking at something that has agar in it or carrageenan or one of the alginates from the brown seaweeds. And agar, these are the red, agar and carrageenan are from particular red seaweeds and they have some really interesting properties. Um, they're complex molecules, very large, and so they can't be synthesized. So we are reliant on them coming from either wild harvest or farmed supplies. And same with alginates, they're salts of alginic acid. Um, and again, they have all sorts of interesting properties, very bespoke kind of properties really. Um, and carrageenan reacts with um, calcium. And so there's a whole, or some carrageenan, some isomers of carrageenan react with um, uh, calcium. And so you have particular kind of calcium, uh, various sorts of puddings and things that use dairy products. And so this is a huge amount of interest at the moment about seaweeds in the literature and in the popular press. So seaweeds to the rescue of forgotten diseases and fucoidin that can help look at um, various things like colitis or antioxidant nutraceuticals or, you know, health and nutrition articles, um, hepatitis C, um, breast cancer, uh, ruminant animal feeds, and that's the whole asparagopsis story, melanoma and brown seaweeds. And then there's uh, phycogastronomy. So lots and lots of interest, which is great because I think it, it's helping to um, diversify people's concepts of what seaweeds are and what's possible with seaweeds. Um, in terms of sea vegetables, there's a lot of interest at the moment at looking at plant-based um, diets rather than animal-based diets. And there's some really interesting properties of some sea vegetables that are, are very good. Seaweeds are not good sources of 
of calories or carbohydrates because our guts can't actually process them, uh, the carbohydrates, but they are a terrific source of some vitamins and minerals, some um, they're a good source of iodine and so on. And there's a bunch of other compounds that are of value and interest and also some protein sources, um, not necessarily protein, fully balanced protein, but, but certainly um, bring some amino acids to the to the party as it were. And then there's all these sort of antibiotic, antibacterial, um, antiviral agents where they have some opportunities as well. Um, and so on the um, left is this old seaweed book, uh, old, um, it was a book on how to cook fish in New Zealand. It doesn't actually have a publication date on it, but I think it's from the 1920s. And so it's talking about making um, edible seaweeds are found on our beach and they can be used for thickening for soups and so on. And edible seaweeds are to be found in practically every part of New Zealand. So this is a recipe for carrageen and cream. And then, you know, it, I'm sure if you go on the internet, you'll see all kinds of sea vegetable cookbooks. Prani Rattigan came to New Zealand a couple of years ago and she's Irish and has written some amazing books on seaweed kitchen and using seaweed recipes. So a lot of people are you know, really interested in that. The molecular gastronomy that was particularly developed by some chefs in Portugal and Spain, they used alginate beads as part of that whole kind of really cool gastronomy stuff. So yeah, lots of, lots of interesting angles that you can take this in. Um, and this was, I was asked to give a talk um, last year, I think it was, to the Scottish Society in Wellington. And, the, you know, the, there's some really interesting old histories about how seaweeds are used. And in 1880, um, Colenso wrote a paper on the uses of New Zealand plants by Māori. And he has quite a few um, examples of particular seaweeds and how they were used to make different types of um, different sorts of dishes. And he talks about rehia, which is very similar to this red seaweed here. This is one in the Northern Hemisphere, but the rehia that um, Colenso talks about is, is, would be have very similar properties. And so here's some examples of carrageenan seaweeds in New Zealand, this one in the foreground. So, you know, you can go and collect that and boil it up with some milk and make a nice dessert if you're so inclined. Um, and similarly, this one. And terracladia is the basis of our um, agar industry in New Zealand. So we have a range of species that are, are useful for those sorts of compounds. Um, so I was also asked to talk about corallines. And, um, Geniculate corallines are the ones that are jointed. So these ones like here down in the foreground and the non-geniculate ones, the ones without joints or crusts usually are all this other wonderful background of pink here. And corallines are um, red algae with calcium carbonate in the cell walls. Not all red algae with calcium carbonate belong to the Coralline Nephysidae, this particular group, um, but the majority do. And they vary a lot in size. They, some of them we think are very long lived. Um, they grow slowly. And in some places they cover up to, you know, totally cover the um, substrate. Maybe a pavement of different species, but they are very, um, very extensive. And they're everywhere from the tropics to the poles. They are literally everywhere. Um, intertidal to the deepest parts of the euphotic zone. They're in rocky shores, they're in seagrass meadows, they're everywhere. Um, and they provide a lot of refuge and grazing areas for other organisms, habitat. They're really important parts of tropical reefs. And like I say, they're everywhere. This is right down in um, the southern part of um, the Ross Sea, and that pink is coralline algae. And similarly, um, this is from a tide pool up near Whangarei, one of the jointed ones, Campbell Island, back down in the south again, um, forming these beautiful shelving kind of arrays. Lots of different growth forms, really hard to tell apart. And as we learn more about them, we understand that actually to be really sure about their identity at this stage of our knowledge, we really need molecular sequencing data. We can't do it by morphology because of their variation and, and shape and form. And this was a picture I took when I was on the Chatham Islands. Um, lots of papa with lots of coralline on their backs and they're grazing on, on coralline surfaces. And what we do know is that papa larvae 
settle preferentially on coralline algae. And so the coralline algae actually release um, a compound which triggers the larvae of the power to settle. So you get these lovely type of images where the baby power that are just beginning to grow shells and settle down are tasting the surface and deciding on where they're going to settle. And that's a chemically mediated kind of event for them. Um, and we know that this is also true for some corals. Sometimes it's really specific to particular species, but other times not so much. Um, there may be larvae, a bunch of, um, of corals may settle on any one of a number of corallines, or they may have a really close species specific sort of relationship. And corallines have actually been also used for sort of bone tissue engineering applications. So using the, the structure of the coralline as a scaffold for bone regrowth and um, really some interesting possibilities about how that might um, be developed. So coralline algae are really important because they're part of the carbon cycle. You can use them as um, in interpreting climate because of their slow growth and the way in, that, in which they incorporate some other um, compounds. Um, biomaterials, really important for stabilizing coral reefs and play a key part in the lives of a number of species with their recruitment triggers and so on, habitats. So we've got some really interesting issues because as things with calcium carbonate, they're very vulnerable to um, ocean acidification. And so trying to understand more about some of those human induced changes, there's some things that we um, are unlikely to be able to change easily, but there's other stresses, sometimes those multiple complex of stresses, which makes things particularly difficult. So it may not be the temperature alone, or it may not be the ocean acidification alone, but it may be the sedimentation, which is entirely preventable or other pollution sources and so on, while we grapple with the bigger question of getting our carbon house in order. Um, so rotoliths are free living non-geniculate corallines and by free living it, it's literally that they're able to roll along on the surface of the um, sea floor and so they grow in quite particular kind of habitats because they have to have enough water motion that they're not buried by sediment they're not um, just sitting in one orientation so that they're actually being rolled so that they can photosynthesize but if the water motion is too rapid then they get swept away so it's a particular kind of habitat that they occupy. And um, they're worldwide, they're, um, they're often associated with really high biodiversity. And it, it's thought that it's because they provide this three-dimensional structure. And so that they provide a refuge, a place for other things to settle and grow. And in New Zealand, we know that there's beds off Pufeki, up um, Great Exhibition Bay, Bay of Islands, Whangaparaua, Kapiti Island, Marlborough Sounds, um, right down to Stewart Island, but they're not very well surveyed yet. And in this past week, Roberta's been up at Great Barrier and she sent me some lovely pictures of some rotoliths in um, Trifina Bay. So some beds around Great Barrier that need exploring as well. Um, so here are some pictures from um, Northland and the rotoliths are growing in these sort of, um, in the green algos, growing and stabilizing, it's a corlopa species and it's stabilizing ridges and the rotoliths are found in between these ridges. They're only a matter of say 15 centimeters high and so there's little troughs and ridges and um, so that's in Karakari Bay. Um, and this picture was taken underneath a marine farm in the Marlborough Sound. So you've got a kinner and a blue cod and a, and a crab and you've got a lot of rotoliths there. Um, so the idea about the biodiversity and their functioning is really interesting. So if you've got this rotolith layer living on top of the sediment, you've got a whole bunch of things that are living underneath, um, various sorts of filter feeders and detritivores and so on. And you've also got other things that are able to poke their up above the rotolith level. And then you've got the rotoliths themselves and all the surfaces that they provide. So you've got cryptofauna, things that live on and inside actually burrowing into the um, rotoliths. So this complexity of habitat is just great for um, a whole range of different types of organisms. But in other parts of the world, we don't see this here, but in other parts of the world, there are some marvelous white beaches that are actually just made up of, of um, 
bleached bits of rotolith or merle. So the, the word merle is used in, in um, France and in Britain and other parts of Europe. And rotoliths tend to be used more in North America and, um, and South America and, and Australia and New Zealand. So that's, there's a little tiny chips of dried um, rotolith. And in Mexico, they have these sand dunes made up of rotoliths. In France for a long time, there was um, the rotoliths were dredged up in, in Ireland as well. And they were used for soil conditioner because of the their calcium carbonate, they like lime. And they'd crunch them up and use them for driveways and things like that to make the driveway look all nice and white and pretty or whatever. But they were destroying habitat at, at quite a um, huge scale. And when they realized in France that the biodiversity of the rotolith beds around France was higher than any other kind of habitat subtitly, then a whole lot of European rules came into place to prevent the ongoing mining of the rotoliths. But this has all been relatively recently, you know, like within the last decade or two. Um, so there was a lot of destruction done for many years. So what we know about um, rotolith distribution is that there is a particular kind of hydrodynamic regime that's necessary. Temperature is important, but it, that's for individual species, but not rotoliths as a whole, because we've got tropical and, and um, subantarctic rotoliths. We know light's important and nutrients, but actually understanding the distribution as a whole is still pretty poorly understood. We do know that um, things like putting a dredge through the middle of a rotolith bed causes huge damage because they're very slow growing and they're not motile so you know they're stuck and that damage takes a very very long time if ever to recover. Um, and in New Zealand some of the most exciting ones um, that we know of are the ones up at the Kermadec Islands at Rangitahua. So at Lesperance Rock which is the southern part of the um, Kermadec chain that's actually a little red dot and that's a little red dot laser light and so they're 20 centimeters apart. And so that gives you an idea about how big those rotoliths are. And that's pretty deep. Um, and they're covered with all sorts of other life as well. So it's not only the coralline, but there's all sorts of things growing on them. And what we are discovering from international work is that rotoliths have this really interesting um, associated uh, community of other things growing in and on them. So if you break open a rotolith, what they're discovering is that there's all kinds of organisms living within the rotolith structure. So it might be life history stages of other seaweeds, might be microorganisms, it can be microscopic stages of say um, dinoflagellates, really interesting um, and complex and super cool. And we know nothing about this in New Zealand at the moment. So it's a wide open area about trying to understand what's going on with our rotoliths. So that picture here, this one, these are rotoliths that were collected up at the Kermadex. But um, yeah, it's true for the rotoliths that we have around the mainland as well. Um, lots and lots to find out there. And so, um, yeah, that's some, um, a very quick zip along. So I guess my message is, if you are a physiologist, there's really cool seaweed questions. If you're a taxonomist, there's really cool seaweed. If you're an ecologist, if you want to you know, find useful compounds for beneficial outcomes for human populations, or, or if you're interested in using seaweeds and stock feeds, or goodness knows only what, there is a huge amount of really interesting research questions that could be tackled using the seaweeds that we have here. So um, yeah. I, I have other seaweeds. Um, I have some a few more slides about things like seaweeds that you can use in your garden because I often get asked about, you know, how do I use them as fertilizer and things like that. But apart from that, I'm really happy to take questions. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Nanny. That was really lovely. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Georgina, yep. um, who said that she has nearly finished her PhD manuscript on CCA cyanobacteria and parrotfish yep. and was just awaiting her molecular results and was wondering if you recommend any curated databases for CCA identification. It, it really depends on where your samples have come from. Um, at the moment, we have a pretty good analysis of um, coralline information in New Zealand based on Brenton Twist's thesis. So he um, 
he was working on the Corallines of Southern New Zealand. And then at the end of his PhD, he was combining in his analyses with stuff that we knew from other parts of the country. And there's about a 140 some species. But I think there's, um, and so if they're New Zealand material, that's a good place to go. But if it's from the tropics, then it really depends where it's from. And so, um, yeah, you're in the, yeah, you're in the Great Barrier Reef, right. Well, I, uh, yeah, we should talk because there's a, a fantastic young um, scientist who completed her PhD in Korea a couple of years ago, and she's postdocing in, um, in Brisbane at the moment and doing some spectacular work. She came and visited us in New Zealand when she's doing her PhD, and I published some stuff with her, but she's finding really interesting diversity, and so she would be the place to go. Yeah, so, yeah. We, we, let's email <laughs> because um, I can give you her, her connection. But she's great and should be really helpful. <laughs> um, we have another question, Wendy, uh, from Lucy. Um, well, uh, her message was, thanks for the talk. Are there any key bar are there key barriers on the biology of New Zealand species that are restricting aquaculture avenues? Um, the the actual sort of infrastructure and rules around farming of seaweeds is a bit of a problem. So from the uh, Ministry for Primary Industries, has, it's not very straightforward for working on seaweeds. Um, and, and so some of that legislation is really dragging and making things hard for people. Um, so there are some moves to improve the situation, but the legislation environment is, yeah, it's a bit tricky. Um, and that may, because you had you need permits to collect the seaweeds from the wild in order to build seed stock and you have to have a particular kind of permission to hold those um, seaweeds on land to perhaps build up your reservoir of material and then you need other sorts of permits to actually deploy them on lines out in the sea um, it's slightly less complicated if you grow everything on land but then you need permission to take water to grow them in. So there's, there's a, and then permission to release that water back into the wild. So there's a bunch of things that are actually quite um, challenges, I think. Yeah, but not, and that's separate from the biology of the species and what you might be wanting to do with them. So, yeah, but there's more and more people interested in this and trying to um, navigate this whole process, yeah. Mm. Cool. We have a question from Inca. Could we use rotoliths to try and predict what New Zealand species might crop up? Sorry, what new species might crop up in New Zealand with climate change? Um, are you thinking about what, what grows on them in different parts of the country? And yeah, um, I think that the there's a potential for understanding a bit more about what the tropicalization of New Zealand. So what things might be coming down from, from our northern parts of the country and further south. Um, there are theories about the rotoliths that they, the deeper rotolith beds, the ones that are in those mesophotic depths between say 30 meters and 150 so meters. They, one of the theories around that habitat is that it might be serving as a refuge. Um, it's escaping some of the things that are going on in the upper surface layers and that that might provide a, a place for to protect biodiversity. There's another theory that says that the, those are completely distinct communities from ones in shallower water. So I'm not sure how well things will um, travel, how well they would be dispersed and, um, and which of the climate change um, variables that are gonna be most problematic. So in some cases it will be temperature Temperature is a pretty big one, and it's whether it's the duration of the temperature event or the the general increase in temperature over time, whether the temperature um, heat waves coincide with reproductive events. You know, there's a lot of ways in which to slice and dice how temperature might be affecting things. You know, um, yeah, there's some interesting things to think about with all of that, um, and whether it's um, whether rotoliths are a a good test situation with their associated species and diversity or whether there's other kinds of habitats where we could also interrogate those sorts of questions yeah so yeah, lots to think about there <laughs> um, well the DMSP over 
um, CCA. Yeah, um, CCA is seed banks. There's the work of Frederick and Kresge and so on is quite, um, they've done a lot of really interesting stuff. The DMSP, there's a, a few people that have done quite a lot of work on that um, in Britain and looking at DMSP re release over um, roadlith beds as well. So um, yeah, if you want to, we can chat about that offline if you'd like, and um, I can point you to some <laughs> other literature and so on. Uh, yeah. Um, Wendy, this question is from a friend um, mm -hmm. who's very interested in invasive species. Are there any um, uh, macroal macroalgal um, seaweeds that, are, that have been invasive here in New Zealand that we, ne that we need to take note of? And yeah. they significantly affected our reefs? Yes, they definitely are. Um, we've just published in the last month or so an update of the number of um, a list of the species that we consider to be introduced to New Zealand. And at the moment, we've, we're recognizing 61 introductions. Um, that's gone up by a third from 2019. So we were at 46 in 2019, and now we're at 61. And there's a few reasons for the increase in numbers. And that's partly because there's work happening internationally, some more sequencing data, some additional collections, a whole bunch of different things. Most of them are not particularly problematic. So they are here and and um, they show an anthropogenic sort of history and we can understand the vectors in many cases of how they got here. But there are a few that are quite, um, you know, dominant in particular places. And so Andaria would be the one that really stands out because it's, um, particularly in some places, really expanded hugely and has significantly altered the composition of communities and so on. So yeah, Andaria is, it would be the main one. Um, but then there's some others as well that have the potential to expand. So um, the genus Hypnia has been reported in New Zealand for a long time, but very, very rarely and very sporadically. But in recent time, it seems to be really taking off. And so you can find it in quite large quantities in some places on the Northeast coast. And there's related species in Hawaii that cause millions of dollars of, of problem for the Hawaiians every year, you know, blanketing beaches and causing all sorts of problems. So yeah, um, there's some challenges and also some challenges with Kualerpa. So um, Roberta's just been on a, um, for the last couple of weeks, working with MPI and NIWA scientists to look at the discovery of a species of Kualerpa up at Great Barrier that's not native trying to understand how widespread that's become. So, yeah. Um, let's see, are there other questions? Did I answer all that? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, we have <laughs> another question from Lucy that says, yeah. I saw that there is a national science challenge that's looking at developing our Kurengo species for uses like Nori. Do you think this would be possible? Yes, I think it would be. Um, I think that one of the interesting things is that Karengo is highly prized by Māori and it's actually in the deed of settlement with Naitahu as that they regard it as a Taonga species and not to be commercialized. So there's some really interesting and important questions to um, consider about co-development and co-design and um, with Māori in particular parts of the country about, and we have a real diversity of species in the Bangiales. So when I started working on um, Porphyra and Bangia, we thought we had one species of Bangia and we had, I think, two species of Porphyra, um, oh, three actually, and two of them were epiphytic and, and um, the other one was just everywhere. And the epiphytic ones turned out not to be even in the same order of red algae. They were something entirely different. And the ones growing on rocks went from one species to somewhere in the vicinity of about 40. So and we've got a number of different genera. We're one of the places in the world that's got one of the greatest diversity of bladed bangiales in the world. So amongst that wide range of species, it's likely that there'll be things that are really amenable to farming. And um, from the Japanese and Korean and, and experience in other parts of the world, once you can nail down the life history, you can actually do, you can manage. And, and this, so it's quite amenable to being managed as it is in, in Japan. But it's of course a question of economics and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. 
And what's next? Yeah, so um, yeah, I published a book on seaweeds. Just It's just a guide to the most common species, about 260 odd. Um, and the first edition was published in 2013. And the second edition was finished last year. Um, because so many names had changed in that intervening period. <laughs> so something like 70 of the 260 species have got new, new names, new understandings. So it's a really dynamic field, everybody. You want to get into this. <laughs> There's so much more to learn. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Any... If anyone else has um, any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, we'll be wrapping up. Thank you for sharing that link, um, Alex. That's a, a really nice little guide to just a few of the um, the main ones, which are really good. Yeah, that that's part of uh, those um, guides that are being produced by Niwa. There's, there's ones on starfish and mollusks and um, all kinds of different groups. So there's sort of um, somewhere between 25 and 35 different ones um, focused on in each of the ones. It's being um, coordinated by Michelle Kelly up in the NIWA office in Auckland. She's a sponge specialist, but she's been roping in all of the taxonomists to do treatments of, of their particular groups. And the most recent one in the series is one on Fiordland. And so it's got um, uh, animals and a uh, range of invertebrates and seaweeds from um, Fiordland. It's, it's a really lovely guide. So yeah. Can go to the DEWA website and find that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I have one last question before you wrap up. What is <laughs> your favorite algae? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get asked that, and it's like, you know, how do you how do you choose? How do you pick your favorite child? Um, it depends on what it's for. It's usually the thing I'm working on at the moment. You know, the one that I'm. But at the moment, I'm really quite cross with the seaweed I'm working on at the moment because it's uh, the answers are not cut forthcoming. It is retaining its mystery. And so, yeah, but um, there are some absolutely spectacularly beautiful ones. And, um, and I know a number of phycologists have actually named their children after beautiful seaweeds. So there is a, a spectacular seaweed in Australia called Claudia was named after the Reverend Claude, I think, but it is the most beautiful thing. It's this lovely lacy um, seaweed. So um, I know somebody who named their daughter Claudia after that seaweed. So yeah, I didn't name any of my children after seaweeds, but um, yeah, there are some spectacular ones. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, for those of you on the call, we do have another speaker night coming up in about two weeks, which will be with um, Abby, who is going to be talking to us about ocean acidification. But yeah, thank you so much, Wendy. Um, no, you're very welcome. And Wendy's email is um, all over the internet. <laughs> if yeah. you want to get in touch. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for joining. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks very much for organizing it. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you were all able to join in. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thank Wendy. You. Bye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.